Hello, everyone. Hey, Josh, thank you for coming. Yep, yep. Awesome. I think we'll just let people and thank you, Abby, for coming as well. Um, thank you both to join us today. And thank you, Tim, for arranging things. And we're just letting people gather for the next couple of minutes. Hey, Jeff. Welcome. <laughs> Trying to make me turn my camera on. Oh my gosh. Okay. Hi, guys. <laughs> Anyhow, I have a flaky internet. Um, I'll just warn you guys right in advance. So if I suddenly drop out, I'll be back. And hopefully things will just continue without me. Just fun. Hey, Abby. Nice to see you. Good morning or afternoon or whatever it is, wherever you are. Thank you. I think everyone on the call right now is in North America. So uh, we'll see some Europeans show up eventually. Okay, so one of the things we sort of do to start things off is just drop a, um, drop a little uh, piece of information in the chat about who you are. And um, that's sort of what we do by convention. I need to make this and put this to the side. This is something that um, Josh likes to see us do so that everyone sort of knows who they're talking to. And Josh, well, if you want to queue things up, you off at, uh, in about two or three minutes, because I know you have to leave at the halfway point. Yep. Okay. And then, Avi, you're good to go from then on. Give us explain things to us too. Then. Sure. Excellent. Okay. Very flexible. Appreciate that flexibility very much. <laughs> Thanks for arranging things, Tim. Okay. Did you uh, just want me to like give an overview of what we do? Uh, and what's it, what, what was involved in actually implementing? Gotcha. Uh, okay. What was actually involved in implementing? So what we're trying to get a handle on is, you know, what does it take to actually put S bombs into build systems? And mm -hmm. yeah, okay. Like from that. So, and thank you for those who've been. Uh, putting things in the chat. Um, consumption security. <laughs> okay, is this a new title? <laughs> oh, I just didn't want to throw my title up there, so I had to kind of. Okay. <laughs> Anyhow, if people could um, sign into the, um, um, I guess the tooling um, is where we kept, keep the people who are, who are participating and then just align in what you're interested in um, and <clears throat> and Sarah you want you're, you're helping to co-host co co this meeting with me okay I'm yes a, yes excellent okay so Josh is here and I've been asking people to put the sign in and the meeting in the chat Thanks, Matt, for putting that there. And um, if and Josh is sort of yep. queued up and ready to go, so I think we could probably start right now. Okay. Yeah. Uh, let me see if this works. Okay, great. Uh... All right, can you see that? Yes. yes. OK, so I do a lot of work with SPDX in the Octo project. Um, if you're not familiar with what the Octo project is, um, we kind of do, I'm going to run through this really quick. We do uh, builds that are primarily targeted at embedded systems, um, but not exclusively. So we can build containers and package feeds and all sorts of SDKs and things like that. Um, kind of the way that this works is we take in a whole bunch of source code and then metadata about how to build that source code, and then we produce whatever the target thing they're trying to produce. So you could kind of think of us as like a quote unquote meta build system if you sort of wanted to, because we're not like replacing auto tools or make or in uh, Mason or anything like that. We actually invoke them to build whatever the underlying software uses to do its builds, and then we take the outputs of that, 
put them into packages, which are your traditional package types that you would see within a desktop distro, like Debian's or RPM's or IPK's. And then we take those and we can assemble them into whatever the final target thing that we're trying to build is. Um, so that kind of gives you a very high level view of how, how we do this. Um, running through it real quick, one of the interesting things that I think sets uh, the Yocta project uh, uh, apart from perhaps other meta build systems is that a lot of the tools, a lot of the quote unquote native tools that we need, we actually build ourselves. And so what we mean by that is um, uh, we don't rely on the host version of GCC that comes on the system you're building with. We all actually build our own host version of GCC and then use that to cross compile uh, the software that goes into our system. So a lot of the, we would call them native, but you can think of them as the host tools. A lot of those tools that we need, we're actually building ourselves. So we have very few like actual host dependencies um, from the system. So it's all very uh, self-contained. It's very easy to do hermetic builds and things like that if you need to. Um, the way we do this is through a complicated system of hashing. Um, which I won't get into in too much detail, but basically like if something changes, like each hash is uh, basically dependent on the hashes upstream from it. So if any hash changes, that's how we know to rebuild everything downstream of that because all those other hashes suddenly become invalidated. Um, I have a whole presentation on this uh, that I can link you to from my talk at FOSDEM, which goes into a, a lot of this in more detail. So if you want the whole, the whole thing, I can give you that. I'm just trying to go really fast. <laughs> so uh, kind of the way that we do this is that at certain points in our build, um, we just output an SPDX document that says like, this is what we did at this point in the build. Um, and because we're like a meta build system, that's actually pretty easy because, you know, we know all of the things that are required to successfully build the software. So we're basically just recording that um, in a in a in SPDX format um, and then writing out the document. And then at the end, we take all the documents and we suck them all together into a single big tar archive. Um, we're hoping to make that final step better with SPDX3. Um, with SPDX2, there isn't a particularly great way or easy way to combine multiple documents together into a single document. Um, but that will be better with SPDX3. So we are excited about that because that will get rid of our big tar ball at the end that just has a bunch of documents in it. Um, and then this kind of gives an overview of the relationships that we generate. Um, so I'm going to spend probably the most time on the slide. Can you see my mouse cursor? Yep, we can. It might be really tiny. OK, yeah. Uh, so basically, um, we have what are called recipes. Um, and those are the thing. That's the file that says how to build whatever the piece of software is. And so when we process the recipe, um, we spit out to this recipe SPDX document. And that basically describes, you can think of that as describing the source code itself and how that source code is built. Um, so we put relationships that say like these, this recipe SPDX document contains the source code. Um, and then we have to know all the build dependencies in order to correctly build the, the software. So we just put in the build dependency of between recipe SPDX documents. So if this recipe needs, depends on this recipe to build, then we put that relationship in there in that document. Um, and this works out really well because, you know, we're building these things in dependency order. So by the time this recipe needs to know, needs to link to its build dependency, we've already written out this recipe document. Um, so that works really well because we're already doing the directed acyclical graph of builds. And so we spit out the documents as we're going. Um, and so we can link them together really well like that. Um, so the recipe and the recipe could contain a whole bunch of other stuff um, about like, uh, you know, the um, what source code was where the source code was downloaded from. Um, what are the licenses that we found in the source code? We do the rudimentary SPDX license scanning um, against the source code um, to try to get the um, concluded license. Yeah, um, mm -hmm. we also like we require our recipes to declare what the license of it is. So we also can have the declared license in there. Um, you know, we don't have it in there today, but we're planning on adding it. We could add like this, the compiler flags that were used um, and things like that. 
Um, you know, we know a whole bunch of different information. I think I've got a slide on that over here because I can't remember off the top of my head. There's just a lot of it. Um, it's not here. Anyway, it uh, must be a different presentation. <laughs> okay, uh, so once we've actually compiled the source code, um, then we split it up into packages, um, which again are just the normal packages that you would expect from like a package manager on a distro. Um, and so then when we do that, we write out these package SPDX documents. And this sort of describes, while the recipe SPDX describes how we built the software, the package SPDX really describes like how the software is used at runtime. Um, and so it's going to have relationships that says it contains all the files that are in the package. Um, and then it also have the generated from dependency on the recipe that produced it. So we can say this runtime package was produced from this build, more or less. Um, but we can also do a lot of interesting things where we can actually use the debug information from the generated executables to find like static library dependencies and things. And so we'll also insert these like generated from uh, to other recipes based on that uh, that debug information, which is really useful. Um, it makes it actually possible to track down like static library dependencies, which historically are quite difficult to track. Um, the thing that we can't do when we generate these packages um, is actually figure out the runtime dependencies. Um, and that's um, mostly because these packages aren't necessarily, um, while the, the, the recipes are built in build dependency order, so there's a directed, directed acyclical graph of build dependencies, um, the runtime dependency graph is not directed, or it's not acyclical, it's directed, but it's not acyclical. Um, and so we can't actually write out the runtime dependencies when we generate this package SPDX document because we have to actually generate all the packages and then we can resolve all the runtime dependencies. Um, and this is not unique to our build system. Um, lots of distros out there have, uh, have non-acyclical uh, runtime dependencies. Um, so it's not just something weird we did. Um, so at a later point, once we've generated all the packages in the system, um, then we go through and we write out these this runtime SPDX document. And basically all this is, is a, it's an amendment to this original package document that's, that adds in the runtime dependency. So you'll see in this runtime dependency, it says it amends the original one, but then it adds in this runtime dependency of to the other generated package SPDX documents. Um, so that's basically what we do there. Um, and then when we're all done, uh, we do some stuff over here, uh, which is, all right. So yeah, when we're all done, then we generate whatever the final thing that we've generated is, uh, the SDK uh, image you can flash to an SD card or boot, whatever. Um, then we write out a final SPDX document for that thing that basically just says it includes, it contains all of these packages. And then we just add in the runtime as an other relationship because I didn't know how else to do it. Because um, <laughs> um, you want this one to include these doc, like link to these documents. But yeah, so you get it. So it says contains package SPDX um, and that generates that big image uh, SPDX document, which is basically just a whole bunch of things where it says it contains all of these packages that are in your final image. Uh, and then the last thing that we do once we've got that um, is we generate this uh, image index and a tarball um, because what we have here is a whole bunch of documents. And what we really don't want to do is rewrite documents after we've written them because SPDX documents, at least in SPDX 2.0, uh, SPDX 2.2, um, they're linked together by their hash. So once we've written a document, we don't want to touch it because that will invalidate all the hashes and just make a ton of work. Um, for us to try to figure out how to rewrite all the documents correctly, which might be actually really hard, especially with the package uh, cyclical uh, dependency nature. Um, so that's why we have all these different documents, but we want to include them all in one thing for the end consumer. So we take all of these documents, starting at the image SPDX, uh, we basically do a recursive tree walk of all the documents that we find, uh, all the links to other documents that we find, and we put them all into a big tarball. Um, 
Uh, and that's really not a standard SPDX thing. That's just what we do to make it easy for our end consumers to get all of the documents in one go. You get the image file, you get like your image file, that's the thing you flash on a disk, and then beside it, you get a tarball, that's all the SPDX documents that are in that image. Um, and then to make things a little bit easier on our users, we've also written this, uh, what we call this image index. This is just a JSON file um, that tells you given a document namespace, what's the file name in the tarball for that file? Um, because that's can actually be kind of difficult to figure out unless you open up every document and figure out its namespace and say this file name is this one. So we just pre-calculate that for everyone with this image index file, um, which is also not an SPDX thing. Um, uh, yeah. Um, Again, we hope that big tarball thing and this image index will go away with SPDX3 because it will be much easier to combine documents. So we'll be able to suck them all together into one big document and be done with it. Um, but yeah, I mean, a lot of this is just information we already have. Um, I don't know if I have the slide that has that list of things. Do, 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 do. Sorry, I was... Uh, I should go watch my other presentation. It's pretty good. <laughs> uh, doo -doo 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 -doo. I think I might have it. Hang on. Ah, yeah, I don't have it here. Yeah, it's it's all information that we already have in our recipe. Like we we require users to correctly annotate like correctly write a recipe that says how to describe their software and so because we already have all of that information it's basically just recording it in spdx um, and we have also as as a project taken a stance that we don't like if it's not something we uh can authoritatively say like this is what this is supposed to be like we don't we don't comment on it in the spdx and the intention of that is that like that will make it easier for us to include like upstream SPDX documents that describe source code without necessarily conflicting with them, right? So if we don't, if we don't know something, we really try not to say anything about it, um, just because we want to provide the information that we know, um, and not really comment on things that we don't necessarily know about. Um, yeah. So I've got about ten minutes for questions. If anyone has any. I think Sarah's got her hand raised, so she can start. Yep, and then also Alan put something in the chat too. So when you're looking at this, uh, thank you for this really helpful um, insight into how you approach um, leveraging SPDX. When you look at this slide that you have up, what would you say is the SBOM? Is it the tarball at the end? Is it the image SPDX at the top right? Like what what would be the outcome of what yeah, someone... it would be if you took the tarball and extracted it, that's your S bomb because that's that's everything. So that S bomb, so like you you have an image file that you flash to an SD card and boot on a Raspberry Pi, for example, right? Alongside that image file is that tarball. Um, and that tarball tells you all of the packages that are installed on that image that you flash to the to the Raspberry Pi and all of the dependencies required to build all the image all the software that was flashed onto that image mm -hmm. that you put on the raspberry pi right so it's, it's the complete compendium of everything that that we know at least um and so then also, i'm also going to chime this is the reason we introduced the concept of types because the s bomb is considered the software like the um source the recipes and some of that stuff would be considered s bombs by other people right uh, okay so this would be like the build s bomb Build us from uh, yeah the, yeah probably yeah. Although you've got the fact of all the information on what's happening at runtime, which becomes effectively your deployed S bomb yeah. as well. Yeah, it's kind of a hybrid. Like if you really wanted to like draw a line, like all the stuff kind of like half of the package because the package says where it was generated from, so the package links back to the build. But basically everything below this line would be your build information and then everything above this line is your runtime information but they're linked together right right so then a um 
person who's going to consume what you built would take that, you know, they would pull out what they need from the build, they'd pull out what they need from the deployed, and then they would, you know, push it along to the next the next phase building on what you had. So the SBOM is, is evolving. Um, one of the things we're trying to do in, in this working group is figure out how without rebuilding any of the great work that different areas are already exploring and creating is identifying areas to make things faster, easier, accelerate something that might be complicated. So from your experience, uh, obviously, you can only speak to your experience, but is there an opportunity to make this process um, that you go through um, easier? And it could be SPDX or it could be just some other part of, you know, understanding this to begin with through an, an education um, or, you know, one click and everything's rolled up into something. Do you have any um, perspective there? Yeah. Um... I think the multiple, like one of the biggest problems that we ran into, especially early on, um, was definitely a tooling problem. Like no one could consume multiple linked SPDX documents <laughs> the way we were generating them. Um, and so it was very hard to validate them and things like that. Is like we've tried to make this very easy. And honestly, the code for this is like, less than 3,000 lines of Python. So it's really not actually that complex to write. Um, I think the thing, honestly, the thing that, um, the thing that it would be most helpful for us, um, the, the, the problem that we run into, and I think this isn't as much a problem with SPDX2, but it's a little more concerning for SPDX3, um, is what we would like to do eventually is be able to consume SPDX documents from upstream source code repositories. So if a upstream source code repository provides a, an SPDX document, like with like reuse, I think gives you, we'll give you that, right? Someone, someone can correct me if that's yeah. not true. Yeah. yeah. So what we would like to do is pull those in to our thing that we're generating and link to those. So we could have the recipe document say this is the source code spdx and we'll just pull it in on you know without touching it we're just going to pull it into our compendium of stuff so that we can say like oh and here like you can follow this all the way back here's the source code spdx document if you want um and i think the thing that um and then the other problem then the thing that goes along with that that we have a little bit of trouble with is like because of our reliance on minimal host dependencies like we are basically stuck with stock Python <laughs> for what we can implement. And so like, don't get me wrong. I'm really glad that SPDX has this, uh, SPDX3 has this really strong data model under it with acronyms that I don't, uh, um, can't remember like OWL and things like that. Like, I don't understand this like data model stuff. I've never had to deal with it much, um, but it worries me a little bit that I'm going to have to parse that in like stock Python without any external tools. You know what I mean? Like that worries me a little bit. Um, um, but as far as like generating it, like ah, it's really not too bad. Like we take what we know and we spit it into some JSON and it's not, not that big a deal. Right. Like, I don't know. I don't envision SPDX three being that much more difficult than what we have today. It'll just be different JSON. Right. But same Thank idea, you. and hope and hopefully combining documents will be easier again. Like I said, so does that make sense? Awesome, it does. Yeah. Um, I know Matt has his hand raised, and but Alan had also thrown a. It doesn't yeah, show me the hands yeah. when I'm. Uh, oh, there we go. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, I finally got the the user view up. So okay. Uh, yeah, Matt. Uh, I think Alan was first, actually. Oh, sorry. Okay. Oh, uh, sorry. You you made a reference to sort of having the user describe their software. Uh, can can you sort of unpack that a little bit, or if that's something that everyone here knows about, you can just point me to. Oh, what that means. um, yeah. It's uh, we call them recipe. So we have recipe files that describe how to build it. They kind of have they're their own unique syntax, but it's 
kind of like, uh, I don't know the best way to describe it. It's a little bit like a make file, but not quite. Okay. Um, it's it's more rest it's not as bad as make. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it's the same idea. Like you describe, you have variables that you can set or append or whatever to, and then you have tasks. I might be able to, let me see if I can. And that's, that's part of the SPDX recipe model. That's new. No, that's, that's just part of, that's just part of, um, that's part of Yocto. That's how Yocto builds okay. stuff. Um, so, so yeah, so, so basically the way that Yocto says you have to build stuff is you have to write this recipe that says how to build it. And so that recipe has all the information that we need to build the software. So we're basically just taking that information and putting it into an SPDX document, right? Cause like we have to know all that information to build the software, right? So you know, if you don't correctly annotate your build time dependencies in your recipe, it won't build, right? <laughs> so like, we're like fairly confident these are correct um, type of thing. So we're just taking what the user has written in the recipe that describes their software they want to build into the SPDX format, basically. Um, right. Yeah. Thanks. I, I will, I appreciate the link. This is what happens when you haven't touched prod in like 10 or 15 years. Yeah, no, that's fine. That's fine. All of my, like, I still, still remember how to write a make file, but uh yeah yeah yep yep well Thanks. i've checked for you josh um you've got two minutes and i know you had to drop at the half hour um matt you want to ask your question really quickly well it, it was more of a, a a response to your question sarah so ah, talk okay. about how, how you automate so and i put myself on the agenda for may 20th to describe you know how a, a guide that i'm writing for how we do how we would do this with cyclone dx um, so okay. I, I intend to leverage CI build systems, runtimes like Tecton and Jenkins, and they have declarative build artifacts that can directly map to the recipes or formula or tasks. Okay. Uh, and and th that system actually had, and actually it's kind of disappointing that Fresca's fall fallen in hard times here at OpenSSF because they're done, they've done a lot of work in terms of in integrating with SigStore as well as uh, to get different uh, confirm different attestations and bring in different product, you know, for, for the, for the build process in an ephemeral way. Um, but in, a, in addition, it does capture through the monitoring through Tecton chains does capture and verify all the build steps, all the build tasks. So each of those points we can, we can aggregate either SPDX or Cyclone DX, I believe by leveraging CI and CD systems and having plugins to those things. Yeah, that sounds very got, similar got, to got, what we're doing. I've got diagrams that I'll, I can show in a couple weeks too. So yeah, that that sounds similar to what we're doing because we already have all the information about what's going on, so we're just recording it, right? Yeah, um, and, and that was the other thing. That was the other reason we didn't want to like say we don't want to guess things, and we're not trying. We are explicitly not trying to make a like SPDX guessing tool like that can scan our Docker container and figure out what's supposed to be in there because. That's not our job for our build system. <laughs> There's other tools out there that can do that better. So we're just trying to provide what we know about. And then if you want to run an SPDX scanner on the thing that's produced, like go for it, right? Like you can you can totally do that. The, 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 key, the key thing that, you know, you ask what, what the hard parts are, it's basically getting clear identities. So from when you're creating a formula or, or captures of, of builds, it's, it's forcing people to create instance identifiers that are assigned and a testable through something like SigStore. So the key is that if you run two builds, there are two distinct in instances of the resources used to build the software. In terms of Tecton, you have a different you have a different container base image you're running on. You have a different runtime. In our case, in IBM, we use Kata container runtimes for secure container builds, and that's all built upon a custom Tecton and a custom Kubernetes configuration down to hardware. And we need to capture that entire stack, and that's what I'm working on with our our tool chains team to be able to do. Yeah, we haven't gotten to that part yet, but uh, I'm sure we will. A lot, a lot of our users still just build on their local PC and not a cloud thing. So, yeah, um, the model the model does work for for Makefile. Right. So that's I. So in the guide I'm writing is to include Makefile, Jenkins, and and Tecton Fresca. Yep. So. All right, I'll drop a link to my talk that this slide is from and. Um, a couple other talks that I've given on this, if you guys want to watch them, if you all want to watch them later. So, yep, but uh, I do have to go. So, thank you. thank you for being here so much. Uh, I will, if you drop that link in the chat, I'll put it in the agenda so that anyone who's catching the recording later wants to go to that link, they can get it. Yeah, I'll do that. 
Cool. All right. Uh, before we switch gears to George and Tim, David, did you have a a comment? Yeah, yeah, just a real quick comment because Fresca was uh, Matt mentioned um, Fresca. I mean, it's it's not like oh, we're trying to kill. Um, a, at least my understanding of the challenge of Fresca is Fresca has got this wonderful integration of all these different capabilities, but the challenge is that when you have a large integrated workflow, uh, a lot of projects don't want to just replace their entire workflow with some other completely different workflow. It's that, yeah, that, that changeover is uh, rather a big challenge. So, well, it's, um, it's, it's say, so we're not asking people to change. We're saying that, you know, in terms of OpenS, we're trying to create a sterling tool chain reference implementations that we right. lost the Kusari team, basically. So we lost uh, the five or six active developers we had in Fresca. We've lost the yeah. key two or three ones. And in fact, the key ones that were actually working with the Tech Time project to integrate Pullcrest there. So those are ah. key emissaries. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah, I, I think we've, I think both of those are true, which has been a challenge. <laughs> Thanks. Okay. I guess, then thanks again. Um, Josh, and he's dropped now, I guess it's Avi's turn now. So Avi, the floor is yours. Well, I won't say I've got anything nearly as impressive or as fancy as that last one from Josh, but I'll, I'll do what we can. Uh, I'll provide a little bit of background. What's my uh, time frame here? You've got to the top of the hour. All right, I'll try to take a heck of a lot less than that. Uh, so I'll provide some context on it verbally, and then I'll bring up uh, a few uh, screen shares. Uh, I've been working, as I wrote in the uh, both in the meeting notes and in the chat, I'm independent, and I've been working uh, with LF Edge, which is uh, the sub-foundation of LF, on the Evo S project for quite a while, actually, both uh, directly and via the, as the data of the commercial company that originally started it. Uh, in working, and as you know, Tim brought up, and working with Tim and Tim's company, uh, we've been trying to bring, shall we say, our uh, SBOM compliance up to a much higher standard. Let's be polite about it that way. So we had a number of challenges throughout it, uh, and uh, Tim suggests that we speak about some of those here. So I'll provide some context on both what the EVOS project is briefly, just a few short minutes, how it's built, and then how we've uh, gotten S bombs in and some of the challenges we run into. And I think I'll focus much more on the challenge issues that we've hit rather than the structure itself. And feel free to shoot in and stop me. I don't always see the hand, so you can go ahead and just shout. That's fine. Uh, here we go. I believe it's this window. Here we go. All right. This is a public piece. I'm going to completely ignore any of the marketing stuff that's in here because nobody wants to see it. Uh, from a structural perspective, Eve is also an edge virtualized or Edge Velocity, whatever it's called, a virtualized uh, Edge OS. Unlike the Octo, it's not a recipe, you know, a, uh, put it to, a build it together type of thing. It's pre-built. If you have E version 940 for uh, x86-64, then that's going to be one pre-built thing that will run on every x86-64. There's one for ARM as well, and I believe there's risk 5 under experimental. Either way, it's, it's pre-built, completely open source, but it is pre-built. Uh, from the get-go, uh, usually distributed either as artifacts on GitHub, uh, uh, release assets, or uh, on Docker Hub. The, I'm trying to look for a good uh, architectural, oh, there was a good one here. Uh, one of the important pieces about it, I'll get that. Second one of the important pieces about it, it is completely self-contained and controlled, meaning it doesn't, can't do anything without a controller. You can see here, I'm not sure if you can see my mouse. Did my pointer come across? It's coming fine. Okay. So you can see here that it has to talk to a controller, either open source or commercial. There is an open source uh, controller also under LF Edge. There's the commercial one. I noticed the commercial one's got a much bigger logo than the open source one, but I don't think that was intentional. Uh, either way, it's completely pulled from that. It can't do anything locally. It's not changed locally. You want to deploy anything, you go to the controller, you want to update it. Uh, it does the verification and so on and so forth. So you're dealing with what's essentially not a recipe of to build different distributions. We're dealing with what's essentially a single distribution, a single completely set up image for, for your architecture. And you can change it based on the release versions, but that's about as far as it goes. So to understand how we get into the SBOMs and how we scan them and the challenges, it's worth looking at how it's built. Uh, it's, uh, Eve itself is largely built around Linux Kit. I don't know if people, anybody here other than Tim, of course, has uh, experience with Linux Kit. Uh, Linux Kit originally came out of Docker. I don't remember if it's still 
under Docker, the copyright's all open, it's either Apache or MIT. It is a, an OS composition engine. It's not quite as opinionated as some of the edge specific stuff. Uh, I put a sample build file here. This doesn't do a hell heck of a lot, but this you run this YAML file through it and it will pull the various containers like this one and this one. It will essentially compose a fully bootable OS. Uh, it's very specific, very tailored. So if you say, I want uh, uh, an, a bootable OS that does A, B, and C, or just runs Nginx, I wouldn't start with, say, an Ubuntu or a RHEL or a SUSE or whatever and add the packages and trim it down. You're basically composing it just from these bits. This one here actually runs Nginx. I took, took that out of the hat, but it just runs Nginx. So the stuff that's in services will be long running containers. The stuff that's in on boot, non shutdown are one time runs. And the stuff that's in init and kernel are laid out specifically on the file system. Right, this is really just built into one big tar stream and then is converted into whatever bootable OS image you want. What that means is that it leaves you with, uh, well, uh, an OS image, or if you take it a step earlier, a tar stream that you could then go ahead and pass to any kind of scanner, whether security scanner or for this context, an SBOM scanner. So the, if I look at the actual uh, Eve make file and whoever was who said that they like make files, this is an absolutely brutal make file. So if you like make files, do not spend time looking at this make file. I would love to see lots of it cleaned up. Uh, there's, as part of the build stage, there's a root FS tar uh, that will eventually be combined and converted into a bootable image and distributed as an asset. But essentially the root FS tar is created right before that it, right before it's combined into an OS image, it's expanded into a temporary router and then skip the stage for a second. And then it just runs uh, SIFT on it. Why SIFT open source? And they've been very responsive to issues we found, but, and we definitely do not want to be building uh, uh, an SBOM generator on our own. Not core to what anybody is doing either on the open source side or on the closed source side of this company. Uh, generates it and then saves it out. That then is distributed in one of several ways, but that's the basic structure of it. So you're using a tool that takes a whole bunch of OCI images uh, and just spreads the bits out in the right way on the disk, pars that up and converts it into a bootable OS. After it's tarred up, we're taking that, uh, we're temporarily expanding the tar and then just running it through an SBOM scanner to generate an output. In this case, uh, well, you can't see it because it's in the, uh, the config here, but the config we're using uh, SPDX JSON for the output. Uh, in case people are curious as to why, uh, as I said, Eve is LF Edge, subfoundation of LF, SPDX is officially of LF, wasn't much of a question. So to get into some of the challenges we had, I'm sorry, this is not such a fancy slide, but here you go. We had a bunch of challenges around it. So it, this is not in any particular order. Uh, kernel, kernel modules and init. When your kernel is distributed as part of uh, some sort of package manager, yum or, or uh, apt or one of those, it will generally show up in your package databases. If you're actually laying them out directly, directly building a kernel and putting them into a, into a tar and eventually into a disk image, scanners have a hard time recognizing exactly what they're dealing with. Most scanners don't. We eventually push that up, upstream into SIFT. So if they do, modules are a little bit easier in that you can get the module info. And if, yes, file with its magic actually does a pretty decent job recognizing most of these things. It was an interesting experience figuring out how exactly uh, live magic works and then getting that, building some of that natively into Go and then getting it upstream, which is what I spent a week doing. Uh, that is one area of challenge. Another was depth of items. So I can show you an example here. Uh, I believe it's this page. It is. This is just in the open tar. I did a look just for the uh, APK DB installed. You'll see that it's one, two, three, four, five. So about 15 to 20 different installed databases because there are multiple, uh, this is the root, but then there's multiple contained file systems within here. Every one of these is going to eventually be a container. So recognizing that and seeing things not at the, usually when you scan an OCI image or you're scanning a file system or you're scanning a disk image, whatever you're scanning, you usually expect to see, oh, I'm going to see live APK DB installed at the root or I'm going to see my uh, D package stuff, et cetera. I expect to see them there. When things are embedded, it can get interesting. Uh, you also have multiple package databases. Most cases when you're scanning, I think you're dealing with a single, uh, package manager, but if you've got containers embedded within containers or within a file system, you can actually get different ones. You have to be able to recognize them. Uh, compiled binaries was actually interesting. 
most scanners out there will do a pretty good job seeing, okay, I've got, I recognize that this is a uh, package database. I'm going to read it and cross-reference files and so on and so forth. Things that don't come out of there and are self-contained, things like Golang compile binaries generally will carry enough information for you to identify it. When you compile C, you're very often, unless you're really adding a lot of metadata to it, you're basically end up with something that a scanner has no idea what it is. It says, oh, it's a binary. That's about all I know about it. Makes it very hard to then go ahead and say, well, this depended on those five libraries and source came from there, et cetera. Another interesting area ended up being packages inside packages inside packages. Uh, I have yet to see something that actually sanely scans a, uh, got a QCAL image or uh, a raw disk image. And even then, once you do, you end up, for example, inside there, what if you've got TARS inside there and you can have multiple layers of embedding when you're dealing with a whole OS as opposed to just an application or just a single, uh, a single OCI image. Uh, specifically in some of the areas, Alpine packages, uh, how much experience people have here dealing with Alpine packaging and, and the guts of it, I don't mean just running APK ad. Anybody here spent their time struggling with any of that? Oh, I see a hand up, that's uh, Daniel it looks like. Shoot, I said you should just jump in, I won't hear you. No, no worries, it was not a, not a response to the Alpine package question. I had a very specific question about uh, higher scanning containers. So I'm happy to come back to that once you finish the Alpine example, didn't mean to interject. That's okay. This is this slide is the last I have. I'm keeping a close eye on the time. Uh, when you install, install an Alpine package, like most package managers, it goes out, retrieves whatever package it has. In this case, an APK, which is uh, just a, well, it isn't just a target zip file. It's a weird structure, but fine. Installs the various files and then updates its installed database. Uh, that's your ability to install downstream. Upstream, saying I've got an installed database. I'd like to know where this came from. The Alpine database doesn't include everything necessary to go back upstream. It doesn't necessarily include which repository took it from. Did it take it from here? Did it take it from there? You sort of have to know, oh, look, this package was X, therefore, where did it come from? It doesn't necessarily, it gives you a commit, but that commit isn't always so easy to know which repository it came from. You're, if you're scanning something, you really want to be able to go back upstream, and it's missing that. To their credit, they do know it. And there have been various proposals, at least I've seen on their uh, GitLab, about how to add things uh, to be able to go back upstream. I believe there's talk about adding uh, a package URL into the database itself, so that you'd really be able to reliably get it with the various uh, tags available on it. Package mutability is a headache for anybody who's dealt with it. You can have a version of a package, 3.14.0-R2, and that version can be overwritten at any time in the future. They don't, aren't often, but they can be for various patch reasons. You have sources that can disappear. Even once you figure out how do I trace source, they can disappear. Uh, and not everybody cares, to be honest. Uh, for most of Alpine's use cases, it doesn't matter. But if you start caring about things like source tracing and bills of materials, it actually matters quite a bit. What were you going to jump in about now? I'm happy to take a detour. Oh, good. I was going to ask around, um, when, you're scan when you're scanning containers, uh, especially given some of the, the issues you found about, you know, not finding necessarily, you know, nested uh, objects or, or uh, you know, um, you know, yeah, nested in multiple different ways. I guess I'm curious, how much have you, how are you currently, like at what point um, during run or build time are you, run, are you scanning containers just at run time once you have actual container? I'm curious whether you've done any experimentation like scanning at, uh, on the file system and comparing the deltas between what you might find um, just scanning the container versus scanning some of the, the instructions and the source code that goes into generating the container. So I was about to say we're doing at the end of the build pre-run, but I, I really there's a slight variant on that. And I guess it's worth getting into. I didn't highlight it in the, the, the uh, slides here. For most of the images, uh, it's like if you look back at the words that Linux get one here, uh, it's basically taking all these uh, images and just laying them out in a file system and ending up with a tar stream. And so we're just emptying out the tar stream, which is essentially the equivalent of, I've got no CI image, I've got a container image, spread it out and scan it or scan lots of them at once. So we're not scanning at build time or during the build, we're scanning at the end of the build. So if you've got five layers and the last one's from scratch, just includes three binaries, we're just getting the three binaries. Uh, but we are doing it not at runtime. So I couldn't tell you about the comparison, but at the very end of build time, when they're all composed, I guess, together over here, that's almost true. Uh, there are cases, and again, I don't have the slides here, and it will take me more than time than we have to find it, 
where we've said there's stuff that gets put on there that won't quite be caught. And so what we've gone down the process of is enforcing within, uh, I'm not gonna find the link right now, of enforcing within the build process that we don't allow network access during almost any of the builds. So we're running stuff through, uh, the, the builds are happening through Docker BuildX. And we basically disabled network access for almost every image build, every container image build. Uh, and if you disable that, it will allow you network access, but only via the add command. And so we've essentially ring fenced the arbitrary ability to pull things down from the network using to only using add. And since add is well defined, it's supposed to run, which can have, you know, it can run a curl, it can run a W, you got to run some script that you can't figure out. We then are able to actually scan Docker files, find the ads, and actually figure out exactly what they're doing. Actually, we built a Docker file ad scanner. It's also in the open source that uses the same uh, parser. It just it, it library imports the parser that's used by BuildKit, so that it actually can do it, parse it, figure it out, and pull down and use that as sources for things. We specifically use we use it in a bunch of areas, but especially use it for the kernel builds because kernels are so hard to reverse figure out. Uh, if I can, you know what? I actually probably can. Uh, I, 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 yeah, I, I want to. I appreciate that the third answer. I don't, don't want to take up the the rest of the time here. I'd say oh, okay. If, uh, we're I'm running a similar experiment on scanning Docker images at, at various points or, or containers at various points. Um, if you wouldn't mind throwing the that open source uh, Docker file scanner that you're loading to in the chat, that would be awesome. Happy to chat with you offline about some of the more creative experiments we're, we're, we're trying out over here, but still early days, but happy to compare notes. Oh, for yeah, sure. No. I'm definitely happy to. Yeah. And uh, I think, sorry, I just I'll put my Daniel something in the sense that uh, you, if you look at the Octo one, they're also building kernel images with that, the Octo as well. So that's another comparison point for you to play with as well. You're looking for that. Sorry to interrupt, Davi. Okay. To oh, no, not at all. Uh, Daniel, when I'm done, I'll also I'll put my, uh, I'll put my email in the, uh, in the, the, the link to the notes next to my name that way you can always just send me an email if we lose connections from there okay, uh, that. i'll skip with pleasure i'll skip tooling constraints for a moment just so i have a chance to get the other two i want to have a chance for people talking uh okay golang modules uh tag mutability in pseudo versions if i have a, something that's version 2.0.4 theoretically that can change the proxies are supposed to enforce it doesn't but it doesn't always when you actually have things that aren't properly released you get those pseudo versions they include the commits life gets a lot easier and you're much more guaranteed. Disappearing sources, uh, same problem. You can refer to a source that somebody can literally pull offline. Again, the Go proxies are supposed to handle it. One of our bigger headaches has been the main package source tracing. And I'll show you what I mean. This is, I, this is FScript. You notice that it has, oh, here are all the build flags at the bottom and all the dependencies. And it's got versions and hashes, and it's great, except for the actual module itself. GitHub.com, Google FScript, and it says develop. Why? Because when you do go build, as opposed to go install off the network, go build will always put in a no version for it. And then you are left with this blank and you do go version dash M where you use the inherent go, uh, the go libraries and it gives you basically develop for it. Uh, and that, that has been a huge headache to great credit of the SIFT people. They, uh, they, when they see this, they look at the build flags and if they see a main dot version, they will override that and say, oh, this is the version you meant. It's been a long-standing issue with Go. It's a philosophical question. Uh, Matt, I see your hand there. Yeah, I mean, in terms of tag mutability, um, it, this is, I mean, I, I'm just curious because my, my my hope was is that we could always force the use of a Perl with a commit hash. So even if the tag changes, we always have the commit hash to fall back on. Is that viable? So is it viable? I think so. When you're dealing with Go itself, because it uses the Go sum, it'll actually, uh, if a tag changes, it's supposed to catch it and cause all sorts of uh, errors out. Uh, but when you're dealing with something like source tracing, which essentially is an SBOM, it's essentially going to give you here on depend on a protobuf version 120. It's not necessarily going to include this, but it might. There are, there's space to do it. I, it's not a major yeah, it, issue. Yeah, like, yeah if, we change, if we change the ecosystem to force people to, to produce that. So, yeah. Well, I like the idea. I, I yeah. don't remember if it's a force. I don't think it's forced or not. Uh, but a main package source tracing was a has been a, a a big headache, and there's a lot of back and forth. It's a, one or two major GitHub issues on it. Go people, and it's it's philosophical. I get it. I disagree, but everybody's out to have their opinions. Um, and just to finish up, detaching the S bump the artifacts. Uh, where do we put it? So 
partially it's embedded, that final tar file ends up being then built into a QCAO image, which is then packaged up into an OCI image and distributed in Docker Hub. So there's some tooling there to install. We threw the SBOM in there as well. Uh, it's also on the GitHub release assets. You can see somewhere here, here. RIFS SPDX JSON. So you see it's actually there as well. Uh, we consider a separate OCI image. We don't do it as separate OCI image for the sources. Uh, we're looking at things like OCI artifacts. We're looking at things like uh, uh, yeah, cosine and stuff like that. But for now, that's, I, there isn't, I mean, there's sort of becoming a standard where you stick the S bombs, but it's still not all the way there. And it's nice to see that broadly adopted and like make some questions go away. All right, I'm not as good as Josh because I had left eight, seven minutes and not 10 minutes for questions, but go for it. Um, okay. Oh, thanks, Tim. Thanks, Tim. So one of the things that we've heard, I think many of us have heard in many places is SBOMs are just something that somebody else wants. They, if I'm on an open source project, generating them does nothing for me. Is there anything that you'd offer around changes to the open source project or benefits you saw or lesson? You talked about all the challenges, but lessons learned, did it improve the project in some way? Yeah, I mean, some of you are lining up a good question that says Tim made us actually behave well, but it is true. I've had, so the on the commercial side, the, the VP who's handling that from the sponsoring company, the guy named Pori, yeah, I've had many conversations where we've said, okay, we just had another call with Tim and Tim's right, but this is a pain thing to do, but we know this is going to be good in the end. And I, I, I will openly admit that there were times when it was very difficult because it was a lot of work, but come out of it much more cleanly. I like the idea that I can look to people on the compliance side and say, okay, we want to use your, your, uh, your open source or your closed source. Where's the, uh, what do you have in it? And how do we do with the licenses? Every time we comes out there, there's an SBOM attached to it. How is it attached? Oh, well, it's in the assets or it's here. Like I said, that has to be standardized a little bit better or at least widely adopted better, but it's made things just enormously easier to have the conversations about. It's definitely upsides to it. Uh, I Definitely, no question. You've made us better people, Tim. Well, hopefully we're making supply yeah. chains better. That's the overarching goal. The, the, the way I see SBOMs, once we start sharing the documents, they cause us to be more introspective about what we're building and aim for better attributes in what we're building and ultimately to to improve you you change what you're doing as a developer and i mean i guess you, you put it that way like made better people made better developers and the developers are making better open source better product that this is about making a feedback loop it's not just sort of oh i plug this tool into my supply chain I feel like y'all have really lived that. And I, I know it's been painful and yeah. I, I feel bad about parts of that. But no, like, this is this, this is good like pain. Really I have, felt beneficial. I went for a run this morning. It was painful too. That was good pain. Well, there's there's bad pain, there's good pain. There's definitely good pain. Uh, by the way, Daniel, I did put my email on the uh, document there. So you can just pull up yeah. me an email. I'm happy to talk. Matt, I think I see your hand up, but I'm not sure if that's from before. No, it's it's a new one. Um in terms of uh, container scanning. I, I, I mean, I, I would love to build upon Tim's point, um, but I've been running into brick walls trying to get our own Red Hat team to produce S bombs for our base images. Um, so, if you encounter an OCI image or other container image that's been flattened, or I guess the new direction of OCI is to support compressed container images, how can you know? How can we, after the fact, extract much from compressed S bombs? To get anything meaningful if we don't have the you know what's your you know your experience of tools getting s bombs and, and running them against container images if they're flattened or compressed how successful are they i haven't tried all that much in that space to be honest i can start to try and extrapolate from what i've seen but it's going to be you know garbage in garbage out from my head right i suspect tim may have more insight into it this tim's dealt with a lot more than i have well, I think some of the patterns, like what Avi is talking about, the um, introspection of the Docker file level, if you're able to get back to that and look at the ads and things like that, that's one of the ways it's not just the, um, I, I think Avi's approach has been a mix of scanning the outputs, but also scanning the inputs. And I know we always get into these kind of philosophical discussions as one sufficient or, or the other are both impossibly insufficient. And I, I think you kind of end up having to cover multiple bases and that that's proved useful. We've we've learned a lot of things on both sides, surprises in both. 
one of the interesting areas has been integration with build tools. I, I myself have contributed to BuildKit. I love it and hate it at the same time. It is so freaking complex to try and contribute to it. It is very powerful. And I've said that to the people there as well. Um, there's work going on in two different places to do uh, uh, SBOM integration there. One is at the build level and the other is at the end of the build to be able to have an integration, a, uh, a scan, uh, which would make things a lot easier in many ways. I do not know how mature or ready that is. It would make my Docker file ad scanner thing go away. It would make some other integrations we've done go, done go away. Uh, but uh, I think it, Build tools are a better place to do a lot of the stuff we've done. I'm just, uh, it's, stuff is still young. Two minutes left at the top of the hour. Anybody else? Well, I think we've, I'm not seeing any hands going up, so I think we've caught but thank you very much for going through that. That was very insightful for us all. Um, thank you for listening. Yeah. And uh, I think we've got to um, also move to other props right now. And so, yes, <laughs> Sarah's put up the applause symbol. Very good. Anyhow, thanks everyone for coming and the notes are there. And if I've got anything recorded wrong, please feel free to correct. Talk to you in, the, in two weeks time. Bye. -o.